things with the computer, and I just wanted to bring up one thing real quick here that you know we said that in any any process, whether it's with the computer or it's not with the computer, you've got some parts to it here. This is even for data processing, which we go back to that. But you've got to have some form of input, meaning you've got raw data you're putting in there, and then you've got a process, and then you've got output. Now, let's say you got a stack of uh, bills that you've collected over the month, and you got a stack of checks that you, your income. Well, I guess with us it's one check, but by looking at the two, you can't tell whether you've made money or lost money. The stack's usually bigger bills than it is at that. Well, what you do is you take that, that's the input, your bills and your, and your income, and you're going to process it, which in this case it just will be adding up the bills, adding up the income, and subtracting one from the other. Now, whether you do it with in your head, you do it with a paper and pencil, you use a calculator, you use a computer, whatever. That's the process. And then the output is the answer. From that answer, in this case, it's just going to be uh, taking and subtracting them. You can make a decision. If you subtract the bills from the income and you get a positive number, you know you've made money. If it's a negative number, you lost money. And then there is that rare event that it could equal zero and you broke even, but you know, it's not going to always hit that exactly. But that, that's going to always be true, even with the computer. There is another one here that's an optional part, and that's storage. To keep the output or even the input from one time to the next to be used again, so that you don't have to recreate it. And actually, more and more, that's what we're doing is because a lot of what we're doing is to store, is to keep information like databases and things like that so we can use it time and time again. Now, these are all very crucial. This is probably one of the most crucial, the input. Because if it's not going in correctly, it's not going to come out correctly. So we have lots of kinds of input, uh, and we have Keyboard, we have mouse, we might have uh, voice input, we have scanners, um, you could have car, uh, make, like uh, cards, you know, like your debit cards, things like that where you enter things. Um, now we even have touch screens. Some of these are there for like a mouse, touch screens, and things like that. They're there for convenience. But we also try to get things that are more accurate. And what the more accurate is, is getting rid of as much human possible as possible. The humans make the mistakes. Now, a touch screen is going to be a little more accurate than a keyboard and a mouse because you're actually seeing what you're pushing. Because so often if you're using a keyboard, like a keyboard, you're watching this and not what you're typing, so you may not always hit things. Mouse takes time. Actually, if people would learn the keystrokes for the keyboard, it's a lot, lot faster than using the mouse. You always have to stop reach over, move that mouse, get it to point. There's a lot of things you can do. Voice command is good, but these are actually digital, where voice is not digital because it's got it, it's analog, because it's using your voice, and not everybody's voice is the same. So the computer has to be able to distinguish what the voice is and what it's saying. And they're getting better at being able to do that. The nice thing is that they can, you can zero it in so that it only recognizes a certain voice. So uh, the 
voice and recognize your voice, it won't work. Now, the bad part is, when you got a cold, you're in trouble. You know, the computer doesn't understand that you've got a cold and it's still you. So there are, there are uh, limitations with that. Scanners, use those at stores and stuff. Those are more accurate because it's reading it off of the, off of the item. So it's eliminating the human pretty well a lot. So you don't, especially at the stores. I remember working in the store and you had to, every week the new ad came out. You had to memorize this ad so you knew it was on sale. But the first day you were forgetting things. Of course, the customers will always remind you that you, you know, they watch and see. Of course, sometimes you forget that you can still were using last week's ad. For some reason, the customers never reminded you that you gave them an extra deal and whatever. What's on there on that on the UPC code is not the price. It's the code. It's the uh, number for the item. That's been entered into the computer. And so when you scan that, it just matches it up and it's been told. That way you can change the price of the item without having to chase it up and change it on every single item. The bad part is if they enter the computer wrong, then it's going to be wrong all the time. Or somebody will usually catch it. So that's why they do a lot of work on the input because that's very important. The output, we mostly have this monitor the printer. There is voice output and some of that, but those are the two biggies because either we can look at it and see what we need to know, or we make a hard copy of it because we want to be able to keep it or read it later or whatever. And then storage, what's changed with that is the fact that uh, putting it on, on disks flash drives, things like that, is how much they've changed over the years. That, you know, now, just even those little flash drives, you can get a billion characters on there or more instead of little, our old floppy disks that would hold, you know, several thousand. You know, it's, it's just amazing how, how huge that storage is for that. So this is the process. And what we're going to talk about is kind of what's happening here with the computer. That uh, this has also changed. As they got more memory, they could put more things that the programs could do and so on. And I think a lot of people don't realize just what's involved in the computer. Because again, it does not know anything. And so what I want to do here is kind of do a couple things today is to look at DOS, which is like learning to use the computer with standard shift instead of uh, automatic transmission. That's what Windows kind of does for us. And then look a little bit at the logic and some of the things that uh, work with that. So first we're going to switch over here to the computer for a little bit and talk through some things. All right, in the, in the old days, when we logged into the computer, this is what we would see. Only, yes, I would, we would see this, actually. And I would say C colon, a backslash, and an atto, and the a little greater than sign there, and then the cursor flashing. What that told us, the C drive, that's the drive letter, and C referred to the hard drive. The older computers used to have floppy drives, and one would be named A and one would be named B. And then when they got the hard drives on the computer, they named that C. If you have a CD, ROM, or a DVD player on your computer, that's usually D. And then if you start putting in uh, flash drives and things like that, if you plug them in, then it will usually, the next letter used, so uh, E might be the flash drive when you put it in. It just keeps adding the letters on. When 
this is on the screen like this when it would boot up. This was saying it's now at default that anything you say will be saved to the hard drive to see. The cursor flashing means the computer is just sitting there patiently waiting for you to tell it something. And at that point, we could type in the name of a program and it would start running it. Or we could do some other things. So what I wanted to look at is the is what directories are. Because uh, sometimes I see people, they'll uh, save something on their computer, they just type save, type in the name, and they don't know where it went. And that's just like coming in and just throwing something on your uh, uh, desk or opening up a file drawer, toss, tossing it in, and then expecting to find it, not knowing where it is. So you can actually think about your computer as being like a filing cabinet that you're going to save stuff on there. And inside that filing cabinet, there are different drawers. And we can talk about the drawers as being the hard drive, drive C, the flash drive, drive uh, E, and so on. With our Kemper system, we actually have a drive K. Drive K is your personal drive. It was set up. Now, it is actually called a virtual drive because it is not physically a drive. It's a huge hard drive that's been divided up and each, each little section is given by what your, your username is. And it's simply that's K. That's your your little space on the hard drive. So it's called a virtual drive because it's physically not uh, a single hard drive. And usually when you log in, that's what it's going to be the default. So if you just save something, it's going to save it to your virtual drive. That's where it's going to put it. The nice thing about a virtual drive is no matter where you go, school, if you log into a computer with your login name, it connects to your virtual drive. So you would have, app, you would have access to it, whatever. Now, if you log into a computer and it's not logged in as you, you don't have access to your virtual drive because it doesn't know who you are when you're using it. All right. Now, what DOS does is we would we could actually, as you can see, if I type a drive letter, C drive, or I type the K drive, it actually um, changes to that. So if I type DIR, that stands for directory, it just lists now everything inside or what's on the hard drive of this computer. And the first column here is the date that it was last saved and the time. And this would tell uh, if it's a directory or not. And that's what most of these are. So uh, there's a directory in here for Dell, for Eclipse, Headline. I've got my own, my own directory on here. There's program files. Those are all different files that are on there. Then it says that there are four files, which is just this newsid.exe. I've got a flip chart in here, and then two other little files. This tells how big that file is. Last time we talked about bits and bytes. If you remember, a byte was one character of information. That's how many bytes it is. So this, this particular uh, file has 168,412 bytes of information or 168,412 characters of information is in there. So it's just kind of like telling you how many, I got a report, it was a report. Instead of the number of words, it's the number of letters. 
That's how big it is. Okay? And then down at the bottom it says that there are four files here with that total. So if we added up those four numbers, that's what it would add up to. And then it says that there are 126 billion, 780 million, 575,744 bytes free. So we have room to put another 126 billion characters of information on this computer, on the hard drive of this computer. So I was holding a lot, a lot of room there. Okay, if I go to my K drive, so I type K colon, and DIR that, it actually went clear off the page there. But I've got 80 files saved on my first uh, level of my uh, drive, and there's a lot more used up there. Now, we can actually make our own directories and we can do that by MD, which means make directory. And you can type in your name. So if I put make directory sue and push enter, now if I type DIR, there at the bottom of the list is a directory called sue. So it's like I just made a file folder in the drawer and put sue on it. Or actually, I can even talk about it to that. I put a drawer and I put the name Sue on that drawer. And so if I go CD, that means change directory, and type Sue, now it shows that I'm in directory Sue down here. If I type DIR, it will show what's in there. Well, we haven't put anything in there, so there's really nothing in there. So there's zero bytes in that drawer. But um, there are two directories, but they're just called dot and dot dot, which back actually all those are is to tell you where it came from. It's a way to send it back to where we were. So you don't have to worry about that. So if uh, I'm going to go back to where I was, and I can just say cd dot dot. That takes me back to the previous directory. Okay. Here's a file right here called today. It has 959 bytes. I can actually put it in, in your directory. If I go uh, copy, and then I'm going to copy today, and then I'm going to put that I want to put it in soon. Type that, hit enter, and it says one file copy. So now if I change directory to sue and type dir, there it is. It's in your, it made a copy of it. It's still in the other folder, but I made a copy of it and put it in your folder. Now I can even in this directory say make directory and call it uh, menus. Okay, now by DR, now here's another folder in there called menus. And so if I go change directory menus, now it's showing that I'm in Sue and in the subdirectory menus. So I've opened your drawer and I pulled out the file folder called menus. Well, there's nothing in it yet, but I could save things in there and so on. I could even make a direct more directories inside of menus. I could put a folder for Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or for January, February, or whatever, and they would all appear. So I can get as as many levels as I want or as I need. So it really allows you to file things really nicely. Now, most people, 99% of the people are not going to do it in DOS because this is using it, doing it manually. But this is what Windows will do for you 
is it makes those directories. You, when you type new file or new directory, it will do that. But you just need to understand that the way it's saved in there is in these different folders, in these different directories. And if you don't tell it where to save it, it's going to save it in what's called the default. And that would depend on the program that you're working on as to what it has set up for its default, which you can change, but it's a case of you can set up defaults so you don't always have to keep telling it, save it here, save it here. It knows it. Now, if you saved it already and you call it up and then you tell it to save it again, it's going to save it where it came from. If you want to save it in another place, then you have to use save as and then you can tell it where to do it. But we'll look at that when we get into, into the Windows site. I was just kind of showing you what DOS is. Okay? Now, I'm going to switch back here to the big screen. The other thing that I want to go through is with logic. The computer. computer is a dumb machine. What happens is when we think and we talk to people, we talk and think up here. And the computer's way down here. And so when we tell it things, we're usually trying to tell it the way we would talk to somebody up here. And because we, we talk in multiple thoughts, in whole concepts, it needs to know one little thing at a time. So logic could be a set of instructions. It could be like a recipe. It could be whatever. You know, when you write a recipe, if you're writing it for somebody that does a lot of cooking, you may not have to write things completely out. But if you're writing it for somebody who has, you know, doesn't cook at all, you need to really write out each step so they know what it, what, what it means to do this and to do that. And it's kind of the same way with the computer. We have to be very specific on each little thing. So if I were going to tell somebody um, how to get to, let's say how to get to the office, I can say you go out the door, make a left, turn right right away, go down the steps, turn left when you or turn right when you get out of the stairwell, turn right again right away, and it's the third door on the right. Okay, if I told that to a person, they should be able to do that. But there were a lot of things I just assumed there in telling it. The first thing is that door is closed. Okay, I assume I don't need to tell a person to open the door when they get to it. You can't do that with the computer. If you said go out the door, the computer's just going to walk right into the door. You know, if it was a robot type of situation. So you have to put things in there. Go to the door. Is the door open? If the answer is yes, then you would say go out the door. If no, open the door and then go out. So those are kinds of things that you kind of have to uh, look at. Um, we can tell it how to, you know, when you write programs, all you're doing is telling the computer step by step what it needs to do. And we can only tell the computer so many things at, at one time. And the computer knows how to do two different kinds of things. It, first of all, it can only do one thing because it can tell whether there's something's on or something's off. But it gets commands. So it's been taught what these words are, much like you would teach a dog how to do tricks. The dog doesn't know the definition of a word. 
It just knows this is what it does when it hears the word. You know, it, it's just recognizing that sound. So it's kind of the same thing with the computer. The computer can't define a word and it can't know that it, a synonym is the same thing. It has to be exactly that, that word. You know, you taught the dog how to uh, speak and you always use that word and then you just one time said talk it doesn't know that talk and speak are the same thing okay so the computer's the same way even changing the spelling of something if, if it doesn't like so as far as what the computer can do is it can it can tell whether something is it can compare two things as to, as to whether something is less than greater than equal to less than equal to greater than equal to or not equal to it can compare that and it can do arithmetic it can um, add it can subtract it can multiply and it can divide which the computer uses this symbol and this symbol for multiplication and division do the arithmetic and then it can do these comparisons that's it so all the programs that we write are using these but then we have words that uh, we have written languages now for the computer it's called interfaces that we can speak in English and this converts it to uh, machine code so the machine can understand it it's kind of a translator for us one of those is basic, and that's what I'm going to show you a few words of today. Um, so I'll go back to the computer here. Switch back to this. And so what I did was I had to load basic, which is interpreter for the computer so if I went in here now and I just it's waiting for me the cursor's flashing so it's waiting for me to tell it something and if I just type my name and push enter it says syntax error it doesn't understand what that is <clears throat> so when I type my name in it went in looked up in its dictionary or its command words to see what my name meant it didn't see it so it says I don't understand what you're saying one of the words that we can use is the word print. And I can tell it to print three different kinds of things. And one of them is what's called a string or anything in between quote marks. So if I typed my name and just said print John, it printed it. It just came back and printed it. Now, it has no idea how to spell words so whatever I put in there, it prints exactly that back. I put it between quote, two quote marks. Okay. The other thing that I can print is uh, values of mathematical expressions. So I can say print 5 plus 12. It prints 17. I can even give it six times uh, four minus 18 raised to the second power minus or divided by 32. It's negative 138. And it will figure out the math. So we can have it print things out like that. I can combine things. I can say print 2 plus 5 equals 2 plus 5. Now, what I have there is I have 2 plus 5 equals sign in quote marks, so it's going to print exactly that. And then I have 2 plus 5 not in quote marks, so it's going to print the value of that. 
So when I tell it, it prints 2 plus 5 equals 7. Now I can even I did something like this. If I plug 2 plus 5 equals and have it print 2 plus 7, it's going to print 2 plus 5 equals 9. It has, no, it, it has no clue because <laughs> it's just printing two different things and printing it on the screen together. So it doesn't know that that's not correct. Okay, the other thing that we can print is the value of variables. So if I say print John, but I don't put quote marks around it, it's going to print a zero because John is being called a variable, like x or whatever, but it doesn't have a value. So I can tell it that I want to let John equal 42. Okay, I said let John equal 42. It said okay. It didn't do anything, but yes it did. Yeah, it's because when you go later to say print John, it's going to come up 42. Right, if I say print John, now it's going to print 42 because that's the value. It's stored it in there and it's going to stay there until I change it and print something else. So that allows us what we're going to print out. Now, I can also do things where we put it in the form of a program. And that's when we put statements on here. I'm just going to write these and tell you what they do. It's a simple one. CLS just means clear the screen, and then I'm going to tell it to uh, let x equal 1. So I'm going to start x out of 1. And then I'm going to say print x. And then I'm going to say um, go to, or I'm going to say let x equal x plus 1. Now what that's going to do is it's going to take x, which is 1, and add 1, which makes it 2, and store that in x. So x would now become 2. And then I'm going to say go to 30. So it's going to print 2. And then it's going to let x equal 2 plus 1, which is 3. And then it's going to print 3. So it's going to start printing numbers. So if I type the word run, it's going to take this program and it's going to start executing it in numerical order. So it's going to start with line 10. So it's going to clear the screen, let x equal 1, print x, and it's just going to keep going. And what I end up with is it's counting very fast. You can see we're already up to 250,000. 390,000. They're really quick. So it was just printing out all those numbers. Now, how long will it print? Forever. Forever. Because we never told it to stop. So if I list it out, now I can change line 50 and I'm going to put a put a uh, thing on here so it knows what to do. I'm going to say if x is less than 100, then go to 30. If I do that, it went off the screen over on the side here. up to 23, so I don't know where the other numbers went. And it went off the screen. But that does count them all. Now, I can change things if I went up here and said to 
add, instead of adding one each time, I tell it to add two each time. that you have 
follow the same kind of pattern as to how things are done. But they're all going to have their little specific things that are extra or missing, but the main general things are there. And so that we kind of understand where it saves things and how defaults work and how you can change that. So you know one thing I hear a lot of times is people can't find things when they say and this will kind of help see where they went or how to figure out where they went and things like that. So that's what we'll look at next time in doing things with, and also the printers use defaults too as to how that works and all that.